Hi everyone and welcome to Open Courtauld Hour Restaged. My name is Leila and I'm the Programme Manager for the Research Forum here at the Courtauld. And I want to start by saying, as always, the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for the generous support of all our digital initiatives, especially things like Open Courtauld. Tonight then, to celebrate the Courtauld Gallery reopening its doors on November the 19th, as well as its most significant modernisation project, this Open Courtauld Hour will provide a rare back of house tour, a sneak preview to the Courtauld Gallery and the team behind it. Masterpieces from the Courtauld's world-renowned collection of Impressionist and post-Impressionist paintings, including Manet's A Bar at the Folie Bergère, Van Gogh's self-portrait of bandaged ear, and the most significant collection of works by Cezanne in the UK, will all be shown together in a spectacular restored great room. For those who don't already know this, um, this is London's oldest purpose-built exhibition space in Somerset House. So this hour then is devoted to unpicking the restaging of our cherished Impressionist and post-Impressionist works. And I'm so delighted that you've all joined our experts and curators in looking back at the physical journey of the collection during our closure and in also contextualizing the Great Room in the project as a whole. The hour will reveal the team's secret discoveries. You'll get to see some pictures of how the works were installed. And it will also interrogate in more detail why um, there is a new curatorial story. So now onto the structure of the event. There will be a few talks from our gallery team, and then the session will end with a panel discussion that gives you all the opportunity to ask questions. So what to do is pop these in the chat throughout, and I will try to ask as many of them as I can later on. I also wanted to flag that we are on at Courtauld Res on social media if you want to get any of your questions to us that way. We would also love to know where you all are all actually zooming in from at the moment, so do put that in the chat as well. For now though, I am going to hand over to Alexandra Gerstein, who is McQueen's Curator of Sculpture and Decorative Arts here at the Courtauld. She will then pass on to the next speaker and so on and so on. Thank you, Leila, and uh, thank you all for being here. The Somerset House we know today was built on the site of a former royal palace that languished in a state of disrepair for years. By an act of parliament in 1775, the royal land it sat on was given over to what would become the first, as Leila said, truly public building in Britain, espousing its imperial superiority in Portland Stone. It housed the Royal Navy and a whole collection of tax and government offices previously scattered around London, but also an expression of what today we might call soft power. It proclaimed Britain's cultural might. In this slide, the North Block, as is shown here, was the headquarters of the country's three leading cultural and scientific institutions, or learned societies as they were known. And it's instructive for us to understand how important this power was felt to be in the commission of Somerset House. This North Block um, containing the learned societies functions as a kind of gateway, as a real gateway into the courtyard and into the rest of the, the, the complex of Somerset House, which is a palatial ensemble of buildings whose facades forms and detailing were all steeped in the architecture of ancient Imperial Rome. And this block in particular was closely modeled on a very refined model of contemporary Parisian architecture externally. It is a kissing cousin of the Hotel de la Mint, um, the Royal Mint in Paris, which its architect saw just a few years before construction here. Of the three institutions housed in this building, the Royal Academy was the best represented. It had the most lavish rooms and frankly, it had the most real estate in the building. It was also the only truly public facing of the three. Sorry about this uh, noise of my papers. Um, and it was the one that invited visitors from all over London and abroad to come and visit um, and simply to pay an entrance fee and enter the, the exhibition, which was staged annually. And uh, that exhibition was staged. It showed the best of British contemporary art and um, in the Royal Academy's exhibition room known as the Great Room. Where it was exhibited wasn't really announced on the facade. And in fact, it, it stayed um, not obvious and rather hidden from the visitor's journey as it does in fact today throughout until the final re reveal and more on that in a moment. The Royal Academy was founded in 1768 by a group of artists uh, on the model of other European 
academies. Its aims were to educate artists and uh, to provide a venue for showing uh, paintings and to a lesser extent sculpture and prints and architectural drawings and watercolors um, to, to, to visitors made by its artist members, the Royal Academicians. Here on the left is a portrait of the architect of Somerset House, Sir William Chambers, painted by the first president, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds. They were both founding members uh, um, and Chambers was the first treasurer. Chambers was also um, architectural tutor to uh, King George III when he was young. So it's perhaps not a surprise then when that his name was put forward to, to um, build uh, this great palatial civic complex and that the king suggested chambers. This early plan, I just show you because although it's a plan of the ground floor, it's, it's significant, it's only 1777 and it really encapsulates everything that um, Somerset House and particularly the North Block became celebrated for, which is its, uh, its symmetry. It's um, two mirrored blocks on either side of an archway and you can see the archway and the two dotted lines in the center. Um, and these two uh, symmetrical staircases on either side that are shaped in the form of a D. These staircases would lead um, the, the members uh, to their council uh, chambers and to their libraries. And on the left side where the Royal Academy uh, was housed and where today you enter to the Courtal Gallery, um, the members of the public could also enter. The General Assembly um, at the time was where the Royal Academicians would meet to judge um, which students of theirs would merit getting an award. And so here they are in their finery and the president is the American artist, Benjamin West, who's sitting in the throne, president's throne. And opposite him at the table in, in a yellow uh, waistcoat is uh, William Chambers looking tired, I think. Um, behind um, behind uh, Benjamin West are two women. And that's quite interesting because there were two founding women. These are them, founding members, um, um, Elizabeth, uh, Angelica Kaufman and uh, Elizabeth Moser, um, but they wouldn't have been allowed in this room at the time of the General Assembly. So you can interpret that as you like, but I think it seems to be a tribute of their, to them and, and their importance that he has included them here. You can glimpse the ceilings have paintings that were decorated, uh, the ceiling was decorated with paintings by uh, Kaufman and, um, and Benjamin West. I actually meant to say Mary Moser, I'm sorry about that. So the two women are Angelica Kaufman and Mary Moser. Here I am taking you uh, through the building in a way the, the student uh, to the Royal Academy would have come in. And the focus here is in these drawings is and print is on showing how the the, in, the entrance was used. In other words, it was filled with uh, plaster casts after antique sculpture, so Greek and Roman ideals, kind of models of what, what was the best thing that it was thought at the time uh, artists must uh, learn and learn to to sort of almost uh, register in their in their hand, in their eye, and their brain to then be able to produce art. And so they passed through this space, and these plaster casts were brought um, often from Rome, especially for the opening. Here you have um, the uh, Life Academy, which was in fact a second stage in the progress of the uh, student life. Um, and I think it's also interesting because women were not allowed here to be sketching after the nude model, but they're both represented on the wall in a painting and a relief. So the two founding, founding um, mod, uh, members. This is in fact in the current uh, ticketing hall. And this on the first floor is the um, Antique Academy. So it's really the heart of the academy's learning and students had, were obliged to spend several years practicing after the antique before they could sort of graduate to the um, life drawing. And so you have examples of, of what was considered to be the best um, models in antiquity. And you have the keeper of the Royal Academy supervising the students. You've got oil lamps illuminating the casts and a buzz of activity. So that is so much for the um, artist uh, member and student's journey. And now I'd just like to spend the rest of the, the time talking a bit about the, the journey of the, the, the visitor and what they would come and see. Here is a kind of mashup of a picture, but it's essentially, it's a, a very beautiful pastel, which is in the collection, which you will see upon if you can come visit uh, the gallery when we reopen. And it's a, a pastel 
by John Russell of a porter of the Royal Academy. And here he is showing a ticket, an entry ticket. Um, he's actually at the foot of the stairs uh, in that same space that I showed earlier. Behind him is the torso of the, um, the Belvedere torso, so a kind of icon of antiquity. And then behind him on the staircase, which you can barely see, is a, is a swirl of people. And um, you know where are they going? Well, they're going up to the Great Room to see the annual exhibition. In the first year at Somerset House in 1780, there were more than 60,000 people who visited uh, the um, annual exhibition and over 200 artists submitted work. Over the years, the number of exhibits increased hugely and, and more than tripling in the first 40 years. The majority of exhibits were paintings and you won't be surprised to hear that the overwhelming majority were uh, men. Uh, the public's behavior, which is something that has fascinated uh, critics and art historians, art historians and scholars for a long time, um, was something that was a subject of much, much discussion at the time and was often ridiculed in the press. Reviewers quickly picked up on the tension between what the Royal Academy thought would be their ideal visitor and then the sort of real visitor. So the ideal visitor was a curious person of taste and the, the real visitor was a person who could buy a ticket and wanted to come see what the best um, paintings were on offer and, and it was also a form of entertainment. So the Royal Academy was always very anxious that their, their, their patrons, their visitors did not just treat the visit as another form of entertainment. So that um, kind of language, I think summarizes, well, prepares us well for the um, weird and, and, and crude and sexist image you see here on the left, a, a satire by the Royal Academician, Ro Thomas Rowlandson. It's, um, the title is A Staircase. It's a, it's a kind of play on words on the staircase and the leering uh, men looking um, at all these women kind of undressing as they're falling down the stairs. Thomas Rowlandson is interesting because he, as an academician, is poking fun at the uh, institution itself, but also criticizing the kinds of people that it attracts. And the um, drawing on the on the right is a very beautiful uh, drawing by William Chambers, which is much more high minded and shows what he thought that his staircase represented. It, it, it has symbols of, of music and, 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 and art. And his uh, staircase was, uh, the concept behind it was that it was a going to take uh, visitors on a path towards enlightenment, towards a kind of darkness of, of the street and, and ignorance and up towards the heights of art and civilization and, and, and um, uh, top lit spaces. So at the time, this tension between the two was really, really heavily commented upon. So finally, um, one enters the, the visitor would have entered the great room. And um, just before entering this, this uh, and seeing this uh, site, they would have actually noted above the door of an ante room that, that is between the staircase and, and this uh, space and the great room. They would have seen uh, the, above the door in a kind of garbled Greek, um, let no stranger to the muses enter. And that is, um, a, a sign that says if you you know you are not a person of taste and who appreciates art don't come in so again this is a, a way the royal academy had of sort of fashioning the the typical and perfect um visitor and these uh these prints that were produced also um circulated images that the Royal Academy um, liked to, to, to show of itself, I suppose a kind of image management, um, leading with images of royal visits and official visits, when in fact the visitor would have come in, would have been awed um, and impressed by, awed by the space, impressed by the huge amount, uh, quantity of, of paintings on the wall, but also surrounded by the buzz of noise and, 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 and people. So um, that is, is an interesting contrast. Um, the, there was a, a funny story at the time. Um, there was fear of disorder global, nationally, but there was also a funny, a fluffy story of the time of a young woman in one of the early years who came in and regularly posed in front of her own portrait. And so that was really um, not um, appreciated. But moving from, from that to, to, to more kind of serious architectural matters, architecturally, this uh, space, it kind of has the seeds of what becomes um, in, in through the 19th century, 
you know, the, the typical uh, top lit um, exhibition space. It was uh, borrowed in some ways from the Royal um, Picture Gallery in at, at the Salon, Salon Carré in Paris, which at the time was a, still a, a royal palace of the Louvre before it became a museum. And the big windows you see at the top are taken from Roman baths. And the ceiling was um, painted to mimic the sky, but all and the, and there were trusses concealed behind. So all this enabled chambers to create a very open space and really unlike anything in in a public space before. And here is yet another image of a sort of genteel um, and orderly uh, royal visit. There are a series of watercolors uh, by um, Bernie, Edward Francis Bernie, of the various walls, the various hangs um, in, in 1782. And what's interesting is you can note another particular feature of this room, which was you can see it, or at least you can imagine where it is. There was a line all around the room, and it was called The Line, capital L. And on that line would sort of hung, hang, hung the most, um, well, it was the most conspicuous place to be. And so artists would often fight for that in a prime piece of real estate. The uh, Royal Academy also used the space for what it called its discourses, in other words, uh, uh, its lectures by Royal Academicians on great themes, art and, and, and architecture and sculpture. And um, the, there's a, a famous story that of in 1790 when uh, the first president, uh, Joshua Reynolds, gave his talk, his discourse on um, Michelangelo, a beam cracked. It didn't stop him from, well, it didn't stop the Royal Academy from um, having his lying in state when he died two years later in this room. And then we'll um, now come to the end of the Royal Academy's time. This is after the Royal Academy left in 1837, having outgrown its premises, it moved first to the National Gallery in uh, Trafalgar Square and then to Burlington House where it is today, near Piccadilly. Um, this is, and, and, and the spaces were utilized um, variously by government agencies. And this is the National School of Design that took over in the middle of the 19th century. My final slide, and you note the mezzanine that was installed at some point. My final slide shows a sort of flash forward 100 years to 1945, when the whole Somerset House was devoted to the records of the um, marriage, death, and um, sorry, birth, death, and marriage records. And this was a reading room. So on that note, um, I will pass over to um, my colleague, Barnaby Wright, who will speak about the rebirth of uh, this space with the Courtauld Gallery. Thank you, Sasha, very much for that. And, uh, and good evening, everybody. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about this remarkable room during the period that the Courtauld uh, has uh, been in Somerset House. That is to say, uh, from 1989, when the Courtauld uh, moved from two other locations in London. So when the Institute, the Teaching Institute moved from uh, Portman Square um, and the gallery moved from Woburn Square and the two were reunited in a sense, physically reunited in the north block of Somerset House. And when the uh, gallery opened its doors to uh, the, its first visitors to um, Somerset House in 1990, uh, they were treated in the early 1990s to a very different uh, view of the Great Room, a very different experience of the Great Room from uh, that of its uh, Royal Academy days uh, two centuries earlier. I think when uh, the Courtauld took over Somerset House uh, and the gallery took over its part of uh, the former Royal Academy buildings, the Great Room represented clearly an opportunity, but also a really major challenge for how to make use of a space that was designed for a display of art in the 18th century that was wildly different from the way that art typically was displayed in modern galleries and 
museums uh, in the uh, in say the 1990s. That is to say, not a hang plastered all over the walls like the Royal Academy summer exhibitions of the 18th century, and uh, with very different uh, reasons for showing and sharing art with visitors. And the opening displays in the early 1990s of uh, of the Courtauld Gallery at Somerset House, uh, included in the Great Room, the sort of culmination of one's visit still, um, a very unusual, I think, display. I think it's very ambitious as a display. The Great Room was used to showcase really the uh, Courtauld collection uh, across its historical range. So there was a mix of different types of picture from different periods. And this is a view of it from, I think, 93, with the Oscar Kokoschka triptych, a 1950 triptych, uh, presiding over the room. But as you see, the room divided up um, with these freestanding screens, providing these little sort of niches. So one could have case studies, quite didactic, a way of uh, looking at uh, different slices of the collection. You see uh, Rubens uh, there and uh, Lely below the, uh, the Kokoschka. But then quite sort of innovatively, I think, deliberately using the floor space of the Great Room to um, provide a sort of space to sit and read and meet and discuss. So it was this quite ambitious combination uh, of different functions, uh, which I think was probably designed really to express a certain view of what the Courtauld Gallery was as a university art museum, a place to uh, encounter art, to think about art, to learn about art, but also to sit and discuss uh, what was on the walls, to read. Um, and uh, I think to, if I just move us on one slide further, Oh. Yes, yeah, some colour images from a similar period, uh, and really to present a sort of uh, a view of the Courtauld as a as a university museum. I, I think the uh, the execution of that uh, display perhaps wasn't as successful in many people's eyes as its concept and ambition. In fact, the critic Brian Sewell rather unkindly said it was rather like a British Rail waiting room. Um, I'm not quite sure what waiting rooms on British Rail he had encountered before. I'm sure the art wasn't quite as good, but one got the point that there was this sort of, something was, something suffered, the art suffered somewhat for this approach, however sort of innovative it might have been. And indeed, these initial displays started to become uh, dismantled within a few years. Um, following a, a major exhibition of the Impressionist collection called Impressionism for England uh, in the mid 1990s, in 94, the Great Room uh, was. Dis the partitions were dismantled and the great room was reinstalled with the Impressionist collection. That is the great uh, collection of Impressionism and post-Impressionism that Samuel Courtauld put together in the 1920s and gave to set up the Courtauld itself in the early 1930s. And here you see two views uh, from 1990, from around 1998, uh, showing that collection in the Great Room, hanging on the Royal Academy line that Sasha um, talked about earlier. Here used, I think, slightly more like, uh, I mean, if I'm being unkind, slightly more like a washing line to hang these pictures uh, from. And you have this sequence of Impressionist pictures uh, hanging literally off that line on, on chains with the great central space broken up with sculpture uh, and benches. And I think in one sense, um, the, the, room, I, I think, worked in terms of showing yeah, these great pictures in, in the greatest room in the building. In another, I think it suffered from yeah, uh, this sense that everything was revealed all at once and one uh, sort of moved from one picture to another, uh, sort of shuffling along the line, as it were. 
these displays for, uh, throughout the 90s were interspersed with the Courtauld's uh, loan exhibitions that were periodically also staged in the Great Room. So the permanent collection of Impressionism was taken down periodically and exhibition designers were brought in to uh, design sets for uh, the various exhibitions that were held during that period, which included uh, an exhibition in 96 on William Chambers himself, which you see on the uh, left-hand side, um, and the Art Made Modern Roger Fry exhibition in 1999. Um, and these exhibition designers and these shows articulated the Great Room in very different ways, but always, I think, coming up against this challenge of how to use, how to combine use of the great central space with the wall space that runs around the perimeter and, and different solutions suggested here. Then in 2001 came the Great Art on the Line exhibition uh, curated by uh, David Salkin, uh, one of the lecturers at the Courtauld at the time. Um, and this exhibition really was an extraordinary recreation of a Royal Academy hang, borrowing in pictures that had formerly uh, been part of the summer exhibitions at the, at the Royal Academy. Sorry, my screen's going a bit crazy here at the Royal Academy. And it was, of course, uh, you know, at a stroke, the perfect uh, show for this space and exactly what the space had been designed for. Following that exhibition, um, the Great Room underwent a really dramatic uh, conversion. This was a conversion in 2002 to house a loan collection of 20th century pictures of Fauve and German Expressionist pictures. And the solution chosen at that point was to actually subdivide the Great Room into four uh, four rooms with these overhanging sort of ceiling elements, really denying the space's volume entirely, but providing a very useful and purposeful stage for this new loan collection of pictures. That uh, in major intervention really was only ever designed to last a few years, um, but uh, in fact, it exceeded its expectations and uh, was in place right up until 2018 when the uh, gallery closed for our current major building project. And this is a picture of it um, just not long before we closed, showing some modern British pictures, but showing very clearly the sort of denial of the Great Room as its own single volume. I think people often pass through without even realising, without looking up and realising it was one large space. So in fact, when we closed and were planning uh, this current project, it was clear, I think, from the get go that what we wanted to do was return the Great Room to its single great volume again. And after quite a lot of discussion and thinking about the rehang, it was decided that the Impressionist pictures would move into the Great Room again, would move upstairs from where they were, the floor below in the fine rooms, and there's a picture of that on the left hand side, where they'd hung for many years in a display that, given that those rooms are very sort of uh, heavy with architectural, 18th century architectural decorative detail, chandeliers and the like, actually enshrined those Impressionist pictures as a sort of slight throwback to how they were in Samuel Courtauld's day when he housed them at Hume House, his London townhouse, in not dissimilar surroundings. And I think the collection at that point with us in Somerset House it was cast really to some extent in that way as a sort of total collection. And we wanted the opportunity to do something different with it when we moved it into the great room. So this is an early visualization uh, that was made as we started working with our architects, Witherford Watson uh, Mann, to open up the great room along with opening up and, and hugely refurbishing the rest of the building um, and creating new gallery spaces uh, as well. And it was just a first attempt really to see how we could look at the pictures, how we could think about the pictures in an opened up 
uh, space. But I think already at this point, we were feeling that there were shades here of that slightly washing line hang where everything was sort of exposed all at once. There was no real sense of discovery. And indeed it was difficult without very close hanging to show the great collection itself. And there's a little attempt here at a double hang of the Cezannes, which I think perhaps wouldn't have done those pictures justice. So we began our work with our exhibition designers, with our um, gallery designers, Nissan Richards Studios, uh, to really just think about lots of different options for using the volume of the space without denying it as a single uh, volume. And these are just some initial sketches showing sort of all manner of different ways of using that, uh, that space, um, very sort of preliminary, very uh, sketchy. Um, that then found its way into a number of architectural number of different treatments of an architectural model which we looked at and photographed trying to see how some form of freestanding walls in the middle of the space could work that proved to be quite a sort of challenge to even in on the model get to a solution that felt appropriate but we started to move towards a way of thinking about these as yes, implied or suggested rooms within the room, uh, trying to find ways of feeling that this was one large volume, but at the same time that there was this sense of encounter and discovery through, the, through one's movement through different spaces. So we isolated uh, a number of different proposals, which you, some of which you see here. And then arrived eventually, on plan at least, at this idea of a, a quite simple intervention. It's surprising how simple interventions can take quite a lot of hard work to get right, of two freestanding walls, and then thinking about the idea of articulating the wall that you see with the bar at the Folie Bergère along here, the darker wall, uh, articulating that with a, with a gentle sort of projection uh, from the wall itself. But what looks good on plan certainly doesn't always work in practice and in reality. Um, and so just before the pandemic, in fact, at the beginning of 2020, we got into the rooms again, them having been opened up, and worked to uh, mock up a whole series of different heights and positions in the room of these freestanding walls. And it changed quite dramatically uh, our uh, thinking about how the proportions of this, uh, of this intervention um, and how by reducing height, how changing the width of these walls, we could still respect the volume of the space itself. We used, as you see here, mock-ups of the paintings in some detail to try and really understand how it would function. Two more views here, again experimenting with these pop-out walls. Uh, here, you know, clearly undesirable to break this cornice line, which is such a central sort of uh, feature of the room itself. And then finally arriving at um, a solution uh, for the great room, and this is sort of it unveiled, but without uh, pictures, obviously, um, which uh, we hope and have real confidence now is going to work very, very beautifully and very successfully for the pictures themselves. And a few, just a few weeks ago, we set about uh, reinstalling this uh, room with some trepidation, I should say. Really, uh, lots of changes actually made on the, on the way. Here, little sort of quiz for you to identify which the real bar at the Folie Bergère is. There should be a prize at the end of this. Uh, this is us experimenting with uh, which, uh, which of the, the Folie Bergère frames we would uh, eventually go with. And finally starting to install the major pictures. And I think what we've arrived at here, and this is a bit of a sneak preview, just a some couple of working photographs, is a solution where uh, you do have these implied rooms and where as you enter the space, you really can have this sense of discovery. The collection isn't just presented as a totality. It's something that one encounters um, and that one can move through um, and think about the pictures on their own terms, rather than as just a whole collection, where groupings and pairings of works can uh, provide new insights into the pictures, different ways of thinking and looking at the pictures themselves, and where you have these senses of reveals as you come through and 
move uh, across the space, something like the great uh, Van Gogh self-portrait uh, appears to the side of one of these walls, which has the Gauguin hanging on it. And the bar at the Folie Bergère itself as a sort of centerpiece to, uh, to the experience. And colleagues are going to uh, speak now further about some of those groupings and pairings and how we've used the space to uh, present uh, the Impressionist collection. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Karen Sayre. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to, uh, to be with you this evening to talk about our wonderful collection and it's, um, it's restaging. And as Barney mentioned, um, when we started to think about how we wanted to present the, the Impressionist collection afresh in, in many ways, um, basically three main aspects um, kind of showed up. Um, the first is we, we wanted to literally show them in a better light. And um, you saw the images of the old chains and the picture lights. And so we wanted to give the Impressionists um, a proper setting with daylight that would obviously be controlled. Um, but that's such an important aspect of, uh, of what the Impressionists um, were trying to, to do in a way, the experience of, of looking at their works, um, especially the ones that were made outdoors and, and on, the, on the motif. And then second, we wanted them to be the culmination of the visitor experience at, um, at the Courtauld. And then third, we wanted, we wanted to really recapture the radical nature of Impressionism. One of the issues um, that we found over the years is that Impressionism has become such a byword for just what art is, you know, the kind of quintessential art you see often a Monet um, or a Renoir, that um, we wanted to recapture what it was like when it was first, when these works were first exhibited, the, how unconventional they were, how shocking and exciting they felt. Um, and also for us as the institution, there was also when Samuel Courtauld was collecting these works in the 1920s, there was, all, there was also a lot of pushback and a lot of skepticism. So those were our guiding principles when we thought about the, the redesign of, um, of the galleries. And as, um, as these thoughts were, were progressing, as, as Barney showed and how um, you know, we were kind of, our thinking was progressing with the, with the de designers, the collection went on tour. It went to several venues. And it was a great opportunity for us to see them in different venues in different settings, actually, and also to maybe slightly detach from them in uh, from from their setting in, at the Courtauld and to see them in a new light. And so here on this slide, I'm just showing you a few places that our Impressionist collection went um, and maybe you saw them at some of these uh, places. So the National Gallery, um, the Elster Museum in, in Belfast. I don't know if you went to Japan, that would, that would be very impressive, but uh, they also went to, to three venues there. But the one that I'd like to talk about uh, this evening is the... Um, is actually when they went to the Louis Vuitton Foundation, oops, um, in, uh, in Paris. And I have to say it was quite interesting for, for us because they were gonna be presented in a building that was built by Frank Gehry in, in 2014. And the collection of the Vuitton Foundation and mostly 20th and 21st century art. So in many ways, it was a great place for us to test this ambition that we had of recapturing the radical nature of Impressionism and showing how influential it was throughout the, um, the 20th century. So here I'm just showing you a few, um, a few images. Uh, and actually these are uh, kind of computer graphics of what the, the spaces were, were like, but you can see that actually they're quite vast um, and very quite neutral. Um, and so this is another work. You recognize the Van Gogh with a self-portrait. And this is what it ended up looking. This is uh, how um, an installation shot of what, um, of what it looked like. And then this is what it looked like um, when, uh, when we, were, we were finished. So really large spaces. And we were a little bit worried whether or not the, the paintings could, 
could really hold those those spaces, those really huge spaces. But in fact, they they were incredibly powerful, um, even in such a kind of you know pared down contemporary setting. So it really, um, I think, reinforced this idea that we that we had of showing them in divorced from this kind of 18th century uh, background that that Barney was talking about. And the other thing that we um, that was really uh, kind of reaffirmed during this exhibition was the importance and the interest that people had about um, the, uh, the, the collector in a way, the personal history behind uh, these works. And so here I'm showing you the kind of spaces at Vuitton. And at the very end where there's the star was the, what we call the documentary section. Um, and this was a space to talk about Samuel and his wife Elizabeth Courtauld and who they were, why they collected Impressionism. And so here I'm showing you a few kind of slightly dark, it wasn't that dark shots, but um, it showed you interiors and also letters and invoices and um, the book of poems that Samuel Courtauld wrote on, um, on the paintings. And so this was a very important um, aspect, this idea that people were actually interested in, um, in the personal nature of, um, of, of the story, uh, especially of the, of the Courtauld. But here I'm back into the uh, I'm back into the the great room, and here you can see it's uh, it's very much a working kind of space, and the light fittings are being prepared uh, for for the installation. And as uh, as Barney mentioned, the great room is a, is a very big uh, space, and so the question was, would the works be overwhelmed, and would we be able to retain um, this ability to have the personal encounters with um, with the, the work. So that was, um, that was a very important um, aspect uh, for us. And you can see that actually there are no barriers um, anywhere because for us, it was very important to have this sense of being able to get close to, to the works and kind of wander around the room um, quite, quite freely. Um, it is slightly ironic, ironic that the um, the space is, as, as Sasha mentioned, uh, based on the Salon Carré at the Louvre, which is where the annual um, exhibition of the Fine Arts Academy in Paris was, which is basically everything that the Impressionists were rejecting. None of them exhibited at the, at the Salon, apart from Manet. Uh, so I wonder how they feel about being in this... Um, in this in this space and so we really tried to make it as um, amenable and interesting to um, to them so we knew that articulation was absolutely key um, and as Barney mentioned um, that's why we introduced these free freestanding walls really to give a sense of um, discovery and surprise so you don't see everything in one go um, as um, as, as Barney mentioned. What we did want is to really for you to be able to see the room diagonally. So really get a sense of this, of the kind of floor space and also the height, uh, the full volume. Um, that was very important. So in a way you come into the space, you're drawn in um, to the, uh, the go-gals. And here I've marked the, the spot on the, um, on the floor that I'm taking this photo of, which is when you get close the go gown, then all of a sudden on your left, you notice the bar. So you don't see it from the, um, you don't see it from the entrance, but you kind of discover it on, um, on your way in. And here you see it kind of coming, um, coming a little bit closer. And here you have this, um, this little kind of pop-up section of, um, that's on the wall that really brings the, the bar, the Folie Berger, which is our, our main masterpiece out. Um, so again, the sense of articulation that we were that we were discussing so that not everything is um, is uniform. And then you progress further. And then all of a sudden you look to your to your right uh, and you see Vincent van Gogh's self portrait with um, with bandaged ears. So again, it's um, it's the sense of discovery through through the space. And you turn, and so you see here uh, Van Gogh on your on your left, and then you you're able to see what's behind the Gauguin freestanding wall, and it's a series of very small, lovely, beautiful sketches by the the neo-impressionist artist Georges Seurat, 
And again, it, we were a little bit worried about how these very small sketches were going to look in such a large space, but actually they're, um, they're a wonderful uh, discovery. And I wish I could say that I had planned this, but uh, I didn't. Um, these, uh, this idea of sight lines that you have, and that's the most thrilling, that you have on these different planes, um, works of art that speak to each other. So here, for example, you see uh, on the far left, Georges Seurat's um, little sketch of the um, of the can can kind of dance uh, dancing in the uh, in the halls of the dance halls of Paris, and then you but in the same view you kind of see the bar the Folie Bergère which is also about Parisian nightlife, and then in the furthest uh, kind of central you see uh, Jane Avril by Toulouse Lautrec which is also about a performer in um, one of those very important music halls in, in Paris. So that's been the most exciting in a way is these discoveries that you make by, um, by having these new uh, sight lines um, in, in a way. And then I just wanna finish on one more thing that these, um, that these freestanding walls and this articulation of the space provides, which is the ability to isolate uh, works of art or groups more, more crucially. I've, I've talked about the, the Soha sketches, but here I wanna talk about Claude uh, Monet. Um, and so on this wall, we've uh, put together works that were actually separated before. And that is because they are actually, they were painted um, 15 years apart. So on the left, you have um, Autumn Effect at Argenteuil from 73 and Antibes from um, 1888. And so before we had them in separate sections and um, in separate uh, rooms, but here I, we really wanted to bring them together to make the point about how Monet was treating light because Argenteuil was in the outskirts of Paris. It was a suburb and here obviously it's autumn. So he's contrasting the beautiful orange um, leaves and then the blue sky and the water um, with Antibes, which is from in the south of France. And he said it was this incredibly different light, much sharper, uh, much stronger, almost blinding. And so to be able to show these works um, together was really um, a, a, is a wonderful thing that these, um, these pop-up walls can uh, do allow us. So I, I look forward to, um, to welcoming you in this, in this wonderful new stage for our Impressionist collection. And my colleague, Katy Gotardo, will talk to you a little bit more about one of these other case uh, studies that we're able to bring together in the great room. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, so yes, after this uh, overview of the Great Room and uh, of Somerset House, of the Court of Somerset House, I'm going now to uh, focus on um, one artist who is very well represented uh, at the Court, of the, and that is Paul Gauguin. And um, I chose to speak about the works by Paul Gauguin because uh, just when we were actually devising the layout of the Great Room, so early 2020, um, we received a fantastic uh, manuscript, which is uh, on, on the first slide. And that is uh, the, the last manuscript Paul Gauguin wrote. Uh, in um, 1903, just a couple of months before before he died, and um, and we received this wonderful um, book. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, noticing that I can't see. Oh, sorry, apologies. Uh, I'm going. Voila. Sorry. Um, this acquisition, this uh, gift that we, we received could not have been more uh, serendipitous because it prompted us to think about uh, how to display it uh, for the first time uh, in the new space, uh, in the gallery, but also to display it for the first time to the public because it was never, it had never been seen uh, since he was uh, made. And, um, and because works on paper cannot be on permanent uh, display uh, because they would suffer from light uh, damage, 
the, the manuscript will be initially on view for six months uh, only. And so after uh, the first three months, we will turn the pages so that uh, new pages will be uh, on view. And, um, and I'm saying this simply because if you have the chance to come and see the portal when we reopen, uh, I hope that um, you will also return um, a few months later uh, to, see, to see a new page uh, shown um, from, uh, from this uh, manuscript. Um, the manuscript has just been installed, in fact, uh, uh, this week, at the beginning of the week, uh, next to two other works by the artist. You see at the center uh, the portrait of Mette Gauguin, who was uh, Gauguin's wife. And then on the right, um, a, an earlier, um, also an early uh, work, which Gauguin um, painted when he was living in uh, Brittany in northern uh, France. And to give some context, uh, um, I should say that uh, the Courtauld is really very lucky uh, to own um, what is probably the most significant collection of works by Gauguin in this country, which includes uh, paintings, uh, a sculpture, uh, drawings, and prints. And the collection really spans uh, the artist's career um, from the early marble uh, of Mette, 1877, to, as I said, the manuscript, which um, was really written, thought probably the gestation, the uh, Gauguin's thinking around this manuscript started uh, long before, but, um, but he signed uh, and dated the manuscript uh, February 1903, so literally um, a couple of months before or, uh, it passed. And uh, um, next to them, I just want to show you a, a larger picture of this wonderful uh, painting of the haystacks, uh, which is uh, sitting alongside. And here I thought, uh, like my colleagues, to sort of resurrect <laughs> an old image. Um, old image from 2018, in fact. So this uh, picture, this photo was taken just uh, a few months before the gallery uh, closed. And, and I wanted to show it simply to um, reiterate what my colleagues also said. Uh, these paintings um, in particular uh, were hung between windows. And of course, in very strong daylight, um, the glare, the light from the windows would not be would sort of disturb uh, your view onto the, the paintings. And on very dark uh, um, winter days, uh, the not so good lighting that we had uh, before would actually also prevent you to, from, um, from enjoying uh, these wonderful paintings in the best way. So uh, yeah, it could not have become sort of at a better time uh, our decision to uh, restage or to um, relight this uh, uh, collection in the way that, uh, that we have. Uh, here, um, I'm showing you, yes, this wall that Karen just, uh, just showed. And, um, and it's really the first ascending wall that one would see entering uh, the great room. And, um, and you'll be facing these uh, two amazing uh, pictures, which were um, interestingly uh, painted just a few weeks apart in 1897, when Paul Gauguin was living in Tahiti. And so you have Nevermore on the left here and Terror on the uh, right. And of course, we, we were faced, uh, and especially my paintings colleagues, were faced with, um, uh, with interpretation challenge in the sense that we, we all felt all together that we, these paintings, these works uh, needed to be presented uh, in a new way, not only by um, being on their own on this wall with uh, better enhanced lighting, but also from the interpretation point of view with new labels that would um, make us really think hard how to present to uh, the new public that will come to the court of works that share a similar disconcerting male gaze on naked and partially naked young Tahitian women. And, um, and it is true that for a modern viewer, these paintings can be uh, unsettling, partly because we know that in some cases, these were really young women. Uh, one of them was um, 
a young woman of only 15 years old who uh, Gauguin took on as his own wife when when the painter was 50 years old and um and so we wanted really yeah to to think about uh, new ways to uh, acknowledge how these works are masterpieces because they are and they are um, important um, paintings which were yeah were radical at the time that they were presented the time that they were uh, that they came onto the market in uh, in France and at the same time recognizing that the society has moved on and um, some uh, subjects are no longer easily uh, accepted and so i think that um, he, this uh, um, hard work or the fact that we had to sort of think uh, really uh, hard about how to present in them was um, was really good and something that we did all together as um, as a curatorial uh, team. I just want to remind you why Gauguin was there. He, he really fled the, the Western world um, in search of a better exotic world that was far from the conventions and the rigid laws of what seemed to him the corrected Western uh, world. But he found himself uh, there, of course, behaving um, as a colonialist himself. And though he criticized uh, the territories there, or let's say the people who were managing the territories there for the way they behaved, um, in many ways, it was also uh, absorbed in that type of uh, behavior. And, um, um, and uh, yeah, and some of the uh, things that he, for example, that he writes in, in, in the manuscript and the subjects that he painted uh, can, of course, be um, criticized. Uh, I'm now moving on to Avant et après. Uh, this is the cover, uh, which gives a title, which is um, uh, generally interpreted to indicate that um, the, the text uh, in the manuscript tells the story of Gauguin before and after he moved to, to the South Seas. And uh, here I sort of uh, put together many images that to show you a little bit the uh, extent of uh, the diverse uh, pages uh, of this manuscript. There, are, there is a lot of text. Um, it is mainly made of uh, text, in fact, of words, but um, some pages are interspersed with uh, wonderful uh, drawings and some uh, monotypes. And um, because the volume has been in private hands for over a century, basically since uh, Gauguin really uh, wrote it and designed it, it the work has been hidden uh, from the public eye for uh, all this time and, um, and was known only through not so good um, reproductions which have presented really its full appreciation and so we are proud and enthusiastic to be able to share it now with you in the great space that the great room is and um, and we are looking forward to welcoming you and i stop here and i'm going to hand over to my colleague rachel sloan oh uh, well thank you very much katie um, I'm well aware that time is marching on, so I'm going to be um, as brief as I can. Um, I just um, wanted to wind up by, by focusing on a small group of works by Edgar Degas. Um, and just to, um, to return to what um, uh, all of my colleagues have mentioned at various points over this last hour, this desire to return a sense of the, um, the radical nature of the works of these impressionist and post-impressionist artists. Um, so I want to start by looking at this, um, this rather amazing pastel, um, after the bath, woman drying herself. And it's a symphony of rich, warm colors, and it, but it is also a disconcerting and thoroughly modern representation of a female nude. Uh, she's captured in an awkward pose. She's observed in a private moment in an undistinguished contemporary interior. And it's also a brilliant example of the way that Degas revolutionized the use of pastel, which was a, a medium that had historical associations with very safe and conventional subjects like aristocratic portraiture or still life or rather frivolous genre scenes. And he took pastel and he used it both to, um, to create um, these very tough and uncompromising images of modern life. And also he, um, he, he used it radically as a medium, um, blurring the distinction between line and color and between painting and drawing. So I'm just going to take you through um, how, um, 
how he created these remarkable pastels. Most of uh, Degas pastels um, began life as charcoal drawings of figures on tracing paper. Um, for example, this one, which is now in the Harvard Art Museums, which is one of about uh, nine drawings that are related to After the Bath. It's from about the 1880s, he began to use tracing paper as a way of exploring in depth and at great length a particular pose or composition. And he would do so by copying the outline of, fig of a figure from one sheet onto a new sheet, um, which he would then reverse or adapt as he wished. And um, the figure in After the Bath almost certainly began life as, as such a tracing. And then over that charcoal outline, Degas added the pastel. And he added it in multiple distinct layers of vibrant color. He constantly varied his mark making to produce unusual graphic rhythms and marvelous drifts of color. And the fact that he used tracing paper is really key to the, the look of the distinctive look of his pastels. Um, and that's because tracing paper is is very smooth and it has it hasn't got any any sort of texture or tooth for the pastel to adhere to. So in order to um, to get it to stick to the sheet, Degas had to apply, um, had to spray fixative on each successive layer. And in After the Bath, we could really see, we get, we, um, we really get glimpses of these multiple layers showing through each other. Um, sometimes they allow glimpses of the charcoal drawing under, underneath, as you can see in the, the detail left of the, um, the outlines of the chair showing through the woman's bathrobe, um, or at right, the, at the, um, the edge of her right knee, which um, we can see that uh, Degas made a correction to its outline and, um, and actually deliberately uh, left that earlier outline in. And elsewhere, the color is built up so thickly that it actually resembles the surface of um, an oil painting. And again, subverting convention, Degas didn't smudge or blend the pastel. So not only do the colors remain distinct, but so do the individual strokes. And the result is a kind of pastel that was unlike anything that had come before. Now Degas' radical use of media and his approach to the human body weren't limited to two dimensions. Um, he, he worked in um, pretty much every, um, every medium available at the time. He was equally adventurous and unorthodox when it came to sculpture. And we're really fortunate to, um, to have two of his sculptures of dancers, um, which are included in the new display. And although, although both of these um, have been cast in bronze, um, which of course is a, a highly traditional sculptural material, this is actually done some years after Degas' death. Um, the original sculptures were made of a mixture of wax and clay um, to which Degas um, added an array of unorthodox materials like matchsticks and wine corks for strength. And in the case of Dancer Preparing to Dance on the left, um, he didn't even bother to disguise the wire skeleton or armature, um, the end of which you could actually see poking through the dancer's right hand. Also, um, much as he did with the tracing paper sketches that served as the base for his pastels, Degas used his sculptures as a way of experimenting with and grappling with a particular pose. Um, Dancer looking at the sole of her right foot on the right um, depicts a dynamic yet also extremely awkward position that he explored both in sculpture and in paintings and pastels um, over the course of many years. And he, was, he constantly reworked it as he tried again and again to capture it to his satisfaction in both two or th and three dimensions. Um, and I'm just going to um, wrap up um, by um, telling you a bit about how we decided to display after the bath. Um, in the current display, it is um, juxtaposed, I think, I believe for the first time with uh, Renoir's late portrait of the art dealer Ambroise Vollard. And it's a very interesting juxtaposition for several reasons. Uh, firstly, there's a similarity in the palette um, and the sumptuous handling of color. Um, then, of course, there's the fact that Vallard was um, one of the most important advocates of modern art in France at the turn of the century, and he dealt in the work of both Degas and Renoir. 
Um, and Renoir, in fact, was one of the many artists in his stable who, who painted Vallard's portrait. Um, but finally, of course, um, both, question, both pictures raise important and um, uncomfortable questions about um, the way that men, um, and in, in this case, um, artists and connoisseurs of art um, have looked at women's bodies. Um, we have Vallard on the one hand, admiring a small statue of a female nude by the sculptor Aristide Bayol and handling it really as an object. And then Dega, on the other hand, giving us an unsettlingly voyeuristic view of a real woman in an unguarded, captured in an unguarded private moment. So, yeah, so, so I mean, really, I mean, like, ask, asking a lot of, the, I mean, the, the, the same, addressing a lot, of, a lot of the same, you know, tough questions that are also raised by, by Gauguin's work. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up by saying that, um, uh, as with um, Avant et Après, which is a manuscript, um, after the bath, um, as a pastel and as a work on paper, is um, uh, is is a work that cannot be on permanent display. So if you can, I really, really urge you to get to the Courtauld within the first few months of its um, reopening to see it for yourselves. Amazing, thank you, everyone. Um, we have actually run out of time for a Q and A, but our curators have been answering all of your questions in the chat as they've been coming in. So I hope everyone has a clear idea of their questions now. I just wanted to read one comment before I wrap up, which is, I can't wait to visit the Courtauld again. Attending this talk is a treat for me and it shows that the Courtauld's curatorial team is simply the best, which I think we're all gonna appreciate because they've all been working very hard and are very tired today. But as I say, that is our time up for this evening. The event has been recorded and it will be on the Courtauld YouTube channel very soon. Now, all I have time for is to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies for their support, all our wonderful speakers and for you all for taking the time to join us from wherever you are. Please do stay in touch and check out everything else that we have on at the Courtauld and remember to get your tickets to see our restaged works in real life via the website so you can get them from the 19th of November. Well you can buy them now before the 19th of November and our next open Courtauld hour will be called Can Can and that is on the 25th of November so please do also sign up to that as well. I hope to see you all very soon, maybe even in the gallery. Bye for now and good night.